Welcome to Spotlight on Security. My name is Ross Camp. I head up corporate communications here at Cohesity, and I will be your host today. We're so glad that you're joining us. This is our third installment of the series, specifically designed to cover a diverse range of topics that all have one common denominator, security. And with this, we want this to be as interactive as possible. That makes it much more interesting. So please engage with us on our polls, in the chat, and in the Q&A. And with respect to Q&A, please submit your questions in the module, and we will do our best to answer those questions live. We have a lot on tap today. First, Cohesity's field CISO, Dale Zembriski, better known as Dr. Z, will be speaking with two top-notch security experts who work for organizations that I think you've probably heard of, Netflix and the NSA. They also happen to be members of Cohesity Security Advisory Council. Super compelling conversation ahead. And it would not be a new year if we didn't share hot security predictions and priorities for 2023. And for that, I'm going to have a very enlightening conversation with Cohesity CISO and Head of IT, Brian Spanswick. And for our final segment, we're going to change things up a bit. We all know innovation is key to improving security postures and keeping those bad guys at bay. But there is an art to unlocking that innovative spirit in each one of us and in our teams. We've got innovation expert and best-selling author Josh Linkner on hand to tell us how we can do that. Now on to the conversation with field CISO, Dr. Z, and two leading security experts, Marianne Bailey and Jason Chan. Marianne is an industry maven with over 35 years of experience with the National Security Agency, AKA the NSA. She currently leads the Advanced Solution Cybersecurity Practice at GuideHouse. She's also the recipient of the Distinguished Executive Presidential Rank Award. That's the highest government civilian recognition one can receive for her contributions to national security. Wow. And joining the discussion is Jason Chan, another industry guru with over 20 years of experience in cybersecurity. Jason started his career in the defense industry and he built and led the information security team at Netflix over the past decade. So without further ado, let's jump right into that interview. Enjoy. Marianne and Jason, welcome. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Indeed. You've both been at the center of change in your careers, certainly. You know, if you think about what's happened, Marianne, for you in the last 30 years in the Defense Department, Jason working through the explosion of content streaming, how exciting those things must be. And today, one of the words that we hear a lot in the industry is unprecedented. Everything seems to be unprecedented way too often. So here, here's my first question. If you could take what you know now and go back, say, 20 years, what would you tell your younger self about data security? Marianne, what would be the one message that you would give your younger self? I would tell my younger self not to focus solely on the perimeter. 20 years ago, when we were working cyber, we really just focused on the perimeter. We were trying to keep, you know, we had this uh, belief that um, we needed this hard exterior shell, and we didn't really worry so much about what was going on internally in our environment, which meant what was happening to the data, where the data was, who had access to the data, backing up the data. Everything was focused on setting a very, very strong perimeter. And I just want to give you one real world example. I was in the Pentagon, I think it was 2015, 16 time zone. We came up with all these high value assets in the Department of Defense, and they were things that you would imagine like, you know, our nuclear systems and our weapon systems. Never once did we really think about data. And when I was there, the OPM breach happened. And the Secretary of Defense said, 80% of the people in there are Department of Defense people or Department of Defense retirees. It's all our people's personal data, all of our background investigation data. We never once would have looked at that agency and that data and said, 
that's a high value asset to us. That's really important. Jason, would you concur on uh, on the you know looking at the data? Yeah, and I mean I would absolutely agree with Marianne's point on you know not over focusing on the perimeter and you know maybe a slightly different um, sort of perspective. I would say also be ready for things to change because if you're you know, anything that we sort of build for the long term, it really needs to be flexible and adaptable and we need to be able to improve it over time. So I think that era of these long, like multi-year monolithic security programs is is hopefully dead because things change so much. You know, I don't think I would have imagined 20 years ago that most of your organization's critical data would be held by third parties, right? <laughs> what we would now know as SaaS or infrastructure as a service. So really being flexible, being adaptable, and just having that mindset of continuous improvement and not sort of resting on your laurels and feeling comfortable with maybe what worked yesterday. That's a really, really good point. Uh, and, and I think all of us in security, one of the reasons we love it is because it changes all the time. And there's lots of talk about the human factor of cybersecurity. And Jason, I know that's a big topic for you. How can a CISO gain advantage, Jason, by focusing on the human factor of the attacker? I think it's human nature where we're going to seek the kind of easiest path, easiest path to our objectives. So if you believe that, you know, adversaries, they're not going to worry about like a sophisticated zero day attack if you have external systems facing the internet that are unpatched with like last year's vulnerabilities. So they're going to go the easy route. So I think to to sort of um, to counter that, you need to start with the basics, right? Where, you know, what are the systems you have? Where is the data? Do you have systems protected? Do you have identity? And I always kind of think of it like you're building a wall, right? If you're if the wall is short, you're going to have a lot of folks who can jump over it. A lot of humans can. And as you continue to get you build things up and you get more sophisticated, you're going to be re, be able to repel a more sophisticated nature of adversary. So that's kind of where you where you need to think. It's like a lot of times as security folks, and, and I would say technologists and engineers in general, we can be uh, really excited by the kind of shiny new you know toys that we have available to us. But a lot of it comes back to the basics. Yeah, it seems like it always, uh, you know, the data breach because something was or was not patched, you know, patched incorrectly. So, so Marianne, from the federal space and all that experience, you talk about, you know, the war games or the cyber games where it's think like a hacker. And what's been your experience? Yeah, it's really no different than what Jason said, to be honest with you. I mean, um, uh, an adversary is always going to get in the easiest way possible. Every time there was some major, major breach or some major intrusion, I would always ask our team when we were doing our forensics after action, how did they get in? 90% of the time or more, it's something simple like Jason talked about. And I saw that time and time again. And I, you know, I used to tell people, our red teamers at NSA have some wicked smart people. We had a hard time keeping them because even our own systems, they always got into them very successfully using simple stuff. And never got to use the tough stuff. It's like the fundamentals of anything, right? You can't really be super successful unless you do the fundamentals well. Uh, you know, I had a, uh, a CISO tell me once that they didn't care how the person got in. They just want to know how to recover. And, and certainly recovery is important, but what would you say to that? How important is it to understand what has happened, you know, should a breach or should ransomware type attack occur? I think it is important to know how they got in so that you can make sure somebody else doesn't get in, right? So I definitely think that's important. Um, you have to you have to understand, you know, how somebody's getting access to your system. You have to make sure that you go back and you protect that. Um, one of the things that I tell our clients now, and I would have told my customers back as a government employee, is that, um, you know, I my concern is when there's a major breach in the company. They, they will call in an incident you know, response provider and they'll come in and they'll do some forensics and they'll patch that. Whatever that is, you know, they stop the bleeding, they fix that, and then they leave. That company somehow thinks they're okay. Instead of coming in and really looking holistically about what they're doing, how they're doing, what their practices are, you know, do they have a governance, do they do these things on a regular basis, um, or are they going to get attacked again next week? 
you know, with something else. And statistics do back that up, all right? With people who have had, a, for example, a ransomware attack, there's a high percentage that they're going to have another one uh, moving forward. So, you know, you think about the anatomy of a data breach. And, and Jason, let's build on that, this idea that the attacker's gotten in. And then they start working through and looking for the data. And then they start to, you know, encrypt the data. And then they're going to try to encrypt the backups. And eventually, they're going to try to start exfiltrating the data. How do organizations miss that and what's the best way to see that activity we see large surges in, in um, data moving out things that we're not used to I would say now in many organizations that are sort of cloud first or cloud native or, or even if they're more traditional but they're likely still using one or more SaaS providers you're gonna you're gonna have more and more data flows that are outside of the visibility of a traditional network-based approach so um, I, I tend to think of, you know, I, I look at identity and data as, as the sources of information for to sort of build an understanding of how your systems and data are being used. So I would look to invest in, in logging and understanding around your identity provider, around your, you know, your actual data system so you can see who's doing what to start to build an understanding. Of, um, of of what normal looks like in your environment. So, because w- without understanding normal, it's difficult to tell what what abnormal is and, and sort of when you could be undergoing an attack. That's a really excellent point. And so, Marianne, to you, knowing what normal is and understanding abnormal, how do you know what normal is if it's constantly changing? It's kind of what Jason alluded to earlier. Um, you have to know your environment. You have to know your environment as it's changing. Um, the last, you know, kind of. Um, event that I did, you know, with Cohesity was on zero trust. And, you know, people don't like that buzzword and all that stuff, but it's exactly, it's driving to exactly what Jason is talking about. Understanding the identity of yourself, the humans, understanding the identity of the devices on the network, and certainly, you know, knowing the data, having it tagged, and knowing who has access to it. And when you get that type of an environment, um, you'll know who has access to the data, what they're doing with the data, what they're allowed to do with the data, and the who isn't just the people, it's also the devices on your network. And then you certainly have, you know, you certainly have some type of bounds. You know, you expect some deviation, right? And that's because your network and your environment's morphing all the time. Let's move now to talk about recovery. Too often I see organizations reacting and not responding, right? And there's a big difference there between those two. So the other question that comes with that that I get a lot is, how often should an organization be running tabletop type uh, recovery exercises where you're you know, really practicing? Yeah, I think the answer to that is it depends how well you do. Right. <laughs> I mean, people do continuity, continuity of operations exercises in the military. We've done these forever. Right. You, and typically they're like once a year. Whether you do well or you do awful. That doesn't work. Right. Same thing with your tabletop exercises for an incident response. If you have it down and you do really well, then maybe you don't have to exercise it as well. But if the minute something changes, which is all the time. Right. So the minute your environment changes significantly, all you first you were on prem, now you made a huge movement to the cloud, or even the people that have certain roles and responsibilities. I think once a year is not enough, and I think it depends how well you do. So if you run one once a year, you don't fix the problems that you're having. You run it again next year, you have the same issues. It's not really doing you any good. Jason, what's been your experience with that? How have you seen, uh, you know, finding problems with exercises and then fixing them and moving forward? Yeah, I, I think Marianne really, really caught it there. It's like, well, what are you going to do about, with your learning? So, I mean, I liked, you know, when I was at Netflix, we really embraced this idea. We wanted to create a learning environment, right, where we were committing to continuous improvement. So um, I think, you know, what worked well for us was about a quarterly cadence for tabletops for a sort of like smaller scale issues, because if you think about it, any organization of, of reasonable complexity, you're likely to have you know, a variety of different incident types. And then, so we would typically do once a year for a really large scale kind of data breach type exercise and then quarterly for smaller scale. But really the key is you have to commit to follow up, right? You have to identify what worked, what didn't work. And, you know, it's totally true. Like roles change, people change, regulations change. So making sure you kind of keep your operational processes and your runbooks up to date is really key. So you have to kind of commit to that 
continuously managing the system because everything is changing all the time. This has been a fabulous conversation. I'm so grateful that you've uh, given us your time and your expertise. You think about what we've talked about in this segment, all about the data, it's all about the human, it's all about speaking the language of whatever customer you have. So Marianne, Jason, thank you so much for your time. We look forward to hearing from you again in the future and hope you have a fabulous day. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And as Dr. Z said, Marianne and Jason, thank you so much. What a compelling conversation. And I especially loved how Marianne seconded the need for going back to the basics. That's something that we heard from Kevin Mandia uh, on a previous Spotlight on Security podcast. Uh, you know, we all love these shiny new toys. And as Jason said, uh, you know, that's great, but even the most sophisticated hackers are getting in and all too often they're getting in in the simplest of ways. Marianne also talked about the importance of grading your last recovery exercise uh, and, of course, to take action on the results. But that got us thinking. When you think back to your last tabletop exercise that you or your team did, what was the grade that you would assign to that? We'd like to poll on that. In terms of the grade, was it refrigerator worthy? A solid B? I'm thankful there was a curve. Lots of red ink, or is the response, what recovery exercise? And let's take a look at some of the answers that we're getting here. It looks like a few people are saying what recovery exercise, so we might need to take action on that. Um, but it looks like most are saying a solid B, um, followed by I'm thankful there was a curve. So interesting results, and obviously no one's ever going to have it perfect. Um, but as Marianne said, whenever there is a change, people are infrastructure good to conduct to conduct rather that test over again. Again, thank you guys for participating. We really appreciate that. Please keep it up. Uh, and with that, let's move on to the next segment in Spotlight. I'm super excited to have this next guest and conversation. Joining us now live is Cohesity's own CISO and head of IT, Brian Spanswick. Brian, welcome to Spotlight. Thanks, Ross. Excited to be here. Fantastic. And we're so thrilled you could join us. Brian, you and I know each other pretty well. I think we've got a lot in common. You live in San Francisco, so do I. You happen to love music, as most can tell, uh, as do I. And we both work for Cohesity. Uh, you came to Cohesity in 2021 with a ton of experience managing both IT and cybersecurity organizations within high growth companies including really well-known brands like McKesson and Splunk. It's the start of a new year. I'm sure our viewers would love to hear from you on cybersecurity priorities and predictions for 2023. So if you don't mind, I would love to talk, talk about that. Yeah, let's jump in. Great. So let's start uh, with a topic that's on most people's minds in security, and that is around ransomware. In 2023, we all know the ransomware problem is not going away. In fact, it may continue to get worse. Do you think organizations will take a different approach to mitigating ransomware? I don't know if it's a different approach, but I think they're going to be expanding their approach. I really enjoyed uh, the, the previous interview with Dr. Z, and the comments really rang true about the investment in perimeter security and really trying to prevent the breach. That's really important, but I agree with the comments that were made in that um, really thinking about how do you manage the impact when and if breached, I think is, is as critical. So I think historically you've seen folks uh, invest in the protection or trying to prevent. And I think you're gonna see more and more investments in if the breach occurs, how do you take some of the leverage away from that ransomware attacker? If you've got aggressive RTO and RPO targets, if you've got confidence in maintaining the integrity of your data, through immutable copy, uh, through encryption, some of the basics that were referenced in the in the previous conversation, you're going to see less leverage on the attacker side, and it's going to be a more comprehensive 
um, defense against the impact of those kinds of attacks. Interesting. And Brian, you and I have had multiple conversations over the last year around data protection and the fact that backup, while really important, um, should not be the end all be all and provide people with that false sense of security. Yep, if I'm hit, I'm covered. Right. They need to go beyond the backup. And so I'm curious if you in 2023 think that we will continue to see a trend evolving around cyber vaulting. So I think so. Uh, one of the things I'm seeing that's more of an evolution when I talk to customers, when I talk to our board of directors and executive staff, um, uh, in, in a previous company, a previous role, there was a breach that occurred within the industry. And immediately I got a call from the, a member of the C-suite. I got a call from one of our board members. And the question they asked me is, do I back up my data? Do we back up our data? And I could say with confidence, yes, we do. I was very relieved they didn't ask a further question, which is how could, quickly could we recover our operations from backup? And I think as we've seen more of these ransomware threats materialize in that level of disruption, more and more of the C-suite of the board of directors are asking that educated question is not so much are we backing it up, but can, how quickly can we recover for back, from backup? So when you talk about data isolation um, solutions, it's really with an eye on that. In the old days, you'd be looking for an air gap solution that provided the greatest level of protection of the data. The challenge with an air gap solution is it's very inconvenient to back up. It's hard to have aggressive RTO and RPO targets with those types of solutions. But if you've got a data isolation, data isolation solution, it gets you close to the level of data protection that you would see with air gapping without the inconvenience that you can still be aggressive on your RTO and RPO targets, I really think that that's going to be the priority in the future. I think the emphasis is going to be how quickly can we recover our core processes, not just are we able to retrieve the data. So kind of moving towards a conversation around cyber resilience and that being much more of a focus in 2023. That really feels like the shift to me. I think you've seen a shift from security organizations being compliance focused and then following that a risk based approach to security. I think you're right. A 2023 prediction is that more security organizations are really going to be taking a cyber resilience priority, which means that how do we continue to drive business outcomes in the in the midst of a cyber incident? Got it. OK. So I started hearing a lot about data classification, I don't know, four or five years ago, maybe that was time with things like GDPR. Um, but now I think that topic continues to really advance in importance and priority. Do you think that in 2023, that data classification is going to be an even bigger priority for enterprises? I do think it's going to be a bigger priority. Uh, it's good that, uh, or that, um, certification or government requirements like GDPR have really brought attention to it and it, it really um, uh, motivated organizations to take action. And I think what you're going to see now is that action or that um, uh, categorization of data is really going to help drive the investments within the security teams. It's going to go beyond just being compliant with GDPR. If you think about the level of assets that a CISO has to protect, knowing where your most critical and sensitive data are and being able to be confident in the level of protection, again, both from preventing the breach and then minimizing the impact of breached, um, being able to prioritize those assets based on the classification of the data is going to be an important input as organizations start to build out their security strategy. It's going to shift from trying to protect everything equally to really prioritizing the assets that are going to have the biggest impact. Um, so again, I like that, uh, that um, Initiatives like GDPR have brought attention to it, and I think you're going to see people take organizations taking real action on that on that information. So, in in summary, there kind of not all data is created equal, uh, or has equal importance, and I think boards are also going to be quite aware of that, especially if there is a breach. Do we know which data that we had? It was prioritized. Do we know where it is? Do we know who has access to it? Absolutely. And I can't, we can't make investments in all of, in securing the entire organization equally as much as we'd like to. So it really helps prioritize in those investment decisions. And Brian, I want to, I want to make sure that we get 
to uh, some audience Q and A, and uh, we do have a couple of questions coming in. But before we do that, I, I've got another question for you. Uh, and so, audience, please do continue to submit uh, questions to us. Um, Brian, your role is, is is an interesting mix at Cohesity. Perhaps it's one that we're seeing more of though at other companies, uh, and that is that you oversee IT and security. Uh, and so these are not two distinct functions at Cohesity. So my question is in 2023, how do you see the roles of the CIO and the CIO changing or evolving or perhaps uh, morphing and consolidating? Yeah, I think you're gonna see a different uh, level of accountability across those roles. Uh, historically, the, the CIO has been responsible for providing IT services and the CISO has largely been a risk or a compliance function that tries to influence the CIO. The conversations I have with our executive staff and board really focus on how do we operate the business securely? And what's the right balance between the level of security and our ease of being able to do business or execute our processes? And so when you, uh, so I think you're gonna see more and more where those functions are merged, like in, in, in my current role, or you're gonna see more shared objectization in InfoSec, but they're actually working in concert to ensure that we're able to conduct business securely. And then that really elevates the board and the, and the C-suite to be making good decisions around what's that balance? What's the risk appetite of that leadership organization as we look at the level of security required and the ease of operations based on our business objectives. So I think what you're going to see is that both IT and InfoSec are going to become more business viable. You're going to see a more direct correlation between their responsibilities and delivering the objectives of the organization. Got it. Makes total sense. Thank you for that. Yeah, sure. Let's move on to a question from the audience. Uh, we received this question. Um, please speak to the impact of AI on cybersecurity. And I think if we think about things like anomaly detection, those types of things, uh, how do you see that factoring into cyber resilience moving forward? Yeah, I think it's gonna make, uh, I think there's a lot of opportunities. One of the most immediate that I see is making our detection and monitoring capabilities more effective. You talked about anomaly detection. One of the biggest challenges an organization has is based on all the information that they're monitoring, um, being able to identify notable events that have a that aren't false positives, that have a high correlation to something that requires action, and being able to triage those appropriately so that you can take the right action. Is it do we sh shift into a hyper prevent mode? Have we um, is there a situation where we actually have to move into an incident response process? And um, artificial intelligence is critical to minimize the number of false positives. Most SOCs get a ton of potential of notable events that are potential incidents. And the real challenge is how do you go through hundreds of millions and sometimes even billions of pieces of data and um, get some fidelity from that data from a detection and monitoring perspective? AI is just absolutely critical in that. All right, thank you for that. Another question that's come in, in mitigating ransomware, what percentage of your efforts are on prevention versus planning for impact? Uh, prevention is usually where most, most organizations start. And I do lo love the, the previous um, conversation and what uh, Kevin Mandian said in the previous in the previous spotlight about the basics and the fundamentals. So if you don't have the basics and fundamentals right, a good patching program, ensuring your data is encrypted, uh, those are all protect controls and you really need to have that strong foundation. I think what you're gonna see though is that more and more attack techniques are becoming more sophisticated. They're changing very rapidly. So it makes it difficult to predict, to predict what you need to have in place to protect against those different attack, attack techniques. But if you are also investing in how do you minimize the impact if that breach occurs, it's really um, balancing the scales of how you uh, secure an organization. So I think you're going to see more organizations more and more really try to maintain their protect posture and do more investments in that um, and minimizing the impact. You really need to have that balanced approach. Got it. All right, Brian, um, we we actually received uh, another question here. I think let's try to squeeze this in, one in quickly. Um, 
is anyone hearing C-suite instructions or recommendations to be either less focused on risk and more on productivity or unable to do anything about disaster unless it occurs? I think that the underlying um, truth in that question is that the C-suite needs to be making an informed decision of those types of investments. And that means that they need to have a good understanding of the risk that they own. So one of the things that I that security organizations really should focus is how do they translate risk into business impact um, as opposed to just the potential impact of a, of a control failure or of a breach. But what is the business impact if that occurs? I think if, if um, security organizations are having that, that kind of conversation with the C-suites, they'll be able to make a decision about balancing the business outcomes and operations against the level of risk they have. It's really trying to make that risk real for a person that's responsible for generating or accountable for generating business outcomes. And I've also, Brian, you and I have chatted separately on this very topic. And I remember you talking about the fact that this type of conversation even parlays into budgeting exercises uh, and how you work with your, whether it's your CFO or your finance team or your or other members of your C-suite to make sure that you've got budget allocated correctly. I don't know if you want to say any more about that. Well, and, and that's where, where I think the evolution of the CIO CISO role gets a lot more exciting, a lot more fun. Historically, I've gone to the C-suite or to the board for uh, budget or, or investment, and it's really been seen as a compliance necessity, almost like a tax to do business. And when we have this more um, uh, informed approach to how these investments drive business outcomes, I can sit alongside other business leaders and compete for the same investments. I, I can be making a business case that you invest for, from a business outcome perspective, make these inf information security investments that may make sense um, over investing in another quota carrying rep or another marketing program. I love that we're that uh, InfoSec gets a seat at the table to have those more broad strategic discussions about a business investment. And is not just seen as a as a compliance task tax that's needed to do business. Great, Brian. I'm getting the cue that I need to wrap. <laughs> Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. Always a pleasure. Uh, and uh, again, thank you for joining Spotlight. No, Ross. Thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun. Great. All right. Take care. Thank you. So with that, we are about to queue up our third and final segment of our jam-packed event today. And this one I'm really excited about as well. Uh, Josh Linkner is a creative troublemaker. <laughs> we'll explore more about what that means. Uh, he has been the founder of and CEO of five tech companies. He's a New York Times bestseller, and he's internationally recognized as an expert on innovation. He's also a passionate Detroiter, a father of four, a professional jazz guitarist. So I think he and Brian Spanswick may have something to chat about there. Uh, and he also has a slightly odd obsession with breezy pizza. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Josh Linkner. Josh, welcome to Spotlight. Ross, thank you so much. Great to be with you. Great to have you on the program. So what is a creative troublemaker? <laughs> well, it's not what you think, certainly in the context of cyber criminals. Uh, what it is is somebody who's willing to confront conventional wisdom, someone who's willing to uh, explore the way things can be instead of just the way things are, who's willing to shake things up a bit in order to drive better outcomes and, and ultimately create a, a brand new future. So it's, it's loving troublemaking, that mean-spirited. Okay. All right. I think I might actually fall into that. <laughs> uh, so as you, as you know, and as you just alluded to, we've been talking a lot about security today and cyber attacks are just uh, a growing and massive threat for businesses. And it really takes strategy, strat strategy rather, uh, ingenuity and innovation to stay ahead of the bad guys. Um, so we thought it made sense in this segment to talk with you about innovation uh, and how do you unlock innovation. So in your most recent book, uh, Big Little Breakthroughs, How Small Everyday Innovations Drive Oversized Results, you offer a counterintuitive approach to innovation uh, as well as organizational change. So 
What are some of the highlights that you think might be most helpful for people on today's uh, podcast to think about? You know, we often think of, of innovation as these wild, high-risk, swing-for-the-fences moonshots, but that's actually not the most pragmatic approach. Uh, what I studied, and I spent over a 1,000 hours in research interviewing CEOs, billionaires, celebrity entrepreneurs, even Grammy award-winning musicians, is that the most innovative organizations and leaders do something different. They cultivate high-velocity, small innovations. Think of them as micro-innovations at, at high volume and, and, and on a daily basis. And to me, it's a more pragmatic approach because each one of them are, are, are less risky. They, are, uh, they add up to big things. You're, you're building critical skills along the way, and you're not taking on undue pressure, so they're more accessible. And if you think about uh, what hackers do, that's actually very much often what they do. When you think about, they don't just send in you know, one shot and hope for the best. They might be a denial of service attack. They might be a brute sport attack, but, but they're, they're coming at it from a lot of different angles, trying to infiltrate uh, the castle. That's actually a good metaphor, frankly, for, for, for we in business to do innovation, which is cultivating these, these small little micro innovations. And, and so if, if our goal is let's batten down the hatches to prevent all cyber attacks always forever, that's such a daunting task. And, and our mind goes to coming up with a silver bullet single solution. A better approach would be to sort of chip away at that problem with a handful or even a higher volume, a lot of little experiments, little bets that ultimately add up to big things. So to me, that's the modern approach to innovation is, is cultivating high velocity, high volume of smaller adjustments, tweaks and adaptations, rather than looking for the change the world single idea. Uh, aspirationally look for that change the world single idea. Do you think that they oftentimes just get stuck, overwhelmed, um, uh, exasperated, uh, deflated? What do you think happens there that, that might stifle that level of innovation? That's exactly right, because the stakes are so high. And, and think about the scales of justice. If it's like super high risk and the reward is scary, like we just do nothing. And so when, when the stakes are that high, we as human beings default to, to, to uh, the status quo, there's a problem though. You know, we, we mistakenly think that the status quo is safe, but, but the truth is that, that uh, we tend to overestimate the risk of trying something new, but we underestimate the risk of standing still. And so you and I were chatting earlier that, you know, you live in San Francisco, my daughter Chloe lives there as well. And if you and I said, all right, we have to come up with a single idea to re reduce rush hour traffic. That would be a big task and, and we'd probably lock up. But on the other hand, if I said, all right, the timer's on, let's come up with 20 small ideas. None, none of them individually will cure the problem, but each one might make a little bit of a difference. The whiteboards would be instantly filled. So again, it, it does sort of unstick that the, the process by lowering the stakes when we're coming up with innovative ideas. Interesting. So another element that I think uh, kind of correlates to innovation is this notion of change. Um, and you know how people feel about change. <laughs> they oftentimes don't like it. Um, but perhaps they're thinking about change in, in um, they could think about that in a different way. And so I'm curious if you have any thoughts about how can we sort of demystify or de-risk this notion of change? Yeah, excellent question. You know, it's one of my favorite quotes of all time is by a gentleman named uh, General Eric Shinsiki. And his quote is that if you don't like change, you're going to like irrelevance even less. And, and for me, anyway, personally, it's always stuck with me because, you know, th there's a real risk, again, in, in not changing and not adapting. The, the problem with change is, again, it feels loaded with risk. And the way to de-risk change is to, instead of these big single shots, is to think about it as, 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 as a rapid experimentation. And so again, thankfully they, they came up with a, a COVID vaccine and, and, but here's how that vaccine wasn't invented. There wasn't some dude in a corner office at Pfizer who said, Eureka, go print a billion doses. That would be nonsense. Like, they wouldn't even compete, they, they'd call security. Instead what happened of course, is they ran lots of little experiments. They discarded the ones that didn't work, doubled down on the ones that showed that, that, that had merit to them. And over time, the solution unfolded. That's a good way to think about change. Instead of like these, again, big, all of a sudden changes, think about small ones and think about running little experiments. For example, maybe we run an experiment on how to uh, do an interview process. And we try it on one candidate on one day and measure it and see how it goes. If it looks good, double the size of the experiment. If it doesn't look good, get rid of it quickly. So when we think about change as this all or nothing, bite your 
bullet, you know, bet your career, again, stakes are too high. But when we reduce those to small, manageable, fixed time, fixed money experiments, again, even if they're crude and low fidelity experiments, it's actually a way to de-risk the idea of taking that step forward. So you talked about COVID as, uh, and, and coming up with um, a vaccine as one of the ways in which, you know, uh, smaller steps probably led to a really great outcome. Are there any other uh, examples or thoughts that you might have that you've seen either, you know, out? Where this approach can really pay off. Yeah, the good news is that, you know, we often think of innovation as related to writing code or product innovation or maybe marketing innovation. But we can apply innovation to every aspect of our professional lives. That can be, again, batting down the hatches from a cybersecurity perspective. It can be team engagement. It can be buying supplies or anywhere in between. So first of all, I love the notion of widening the aperture of innovation, applying the tools of innovation to everyday challenges that we're facing as business leaders. Um, the, the other thing I'd say is that generating ideas themselves, uh, there's, there's often this barrier that I'd love to quickly de demystify. We often use a technique called brainstorming, which, by the way, is wildly out of date, and it's good if you want mediocre ideas. The reason is because the very exercise is flawed. When we share an idea, we're instantly responsible for it, as if we're endorsing the idea. And so what happens is people tend to share their safe ideas and hold their larger, bigger, more abstract ideas back. A simple technique I'll just share real quickly. It's a technique that I've developed called role storming, R-O-L-E, which is brainstorming in character. In other words, we might take on an actual real world problem, but Ross, instead of you being Ross, you might play the role of Steve Jobs. Nobody's gonna laugh at Steve for coming up with a big idea. They might laugh at Steve for coming up with a small one. So in this technique, you simply are pretending that you are somebody else, but it's liberating. You can share anything you want, no fear of retribution. So the fear leaves the room, and the thing is that fear and creativity cannot coexist. So this is a better technique, a better framework for generating new ideas. So, super easy. Everyone in the room chooses a different character. You could be a movie star. You could be an athlete. You could be a villain. You could be a six-year-old kid. You could be an alien. You could be someone from the future. But the idea is that you pretend and stay in character. And I know it sounds a little goofy, but you will be blown away how the ideas start to fly and how your divergent thinking really comes to the surface. You could be a pizza maker. <laughs> I recommend it. You recommend it. So, and I and and uh, super interesting uh, conversation, and it's making me actually rethink how I'm running brainstorming sessions with my own teams, because I oftentimes do think we shoot for the moon, uh, but I think it it needs to be we could scale that back a bit and still have some really great outcomes. Is there anything else that I, I didn't ask about that you'd like to, to share today? Yeah, just a couple of other thoughts. You know, when we think of innovators, we think of these, you know, super geniuses or whatever. The truth is that, that uh, creativity, human creativity is something that we all share. I've been studying this for 20 plus years and I'll sh share that the research is crystal clear that as human beings, we are hardwired to be creative. You don't need to be playing a musical instrument or doing interpretive dance to be creative. And in fact, hackers are wildly creative, as we know, but we as cybersecurity professionals can be equally creative in, in combating those threats. So I, I just encourage people to, to bring that sense of creative wonder to the surface. And in doing so, we often think that, oh, I need more resources. I need more money or time or, or bandwidth or computing power. I will say that I often playfully respond that if the amount of creativity you had was equal to the level of external resources you had, the federal government would be the most creative organization on the planet. And of course, we know that startups are probably much more creative than, than governments. Point being is that we can be scrappy. We don't need a bunch of external resources. We can double down on our internal resources of, of inventive thinking, creative problem solving, ingenuity, and likely get the job done. Got it. And, and I think that what we're talking about today seems to be resonating, at least with some of our viewers here, one of the comments that I'm seeing uh, most times, it is these small things that cause the large problems. So I think that we need to sweat the small stuff to find the gaps and the opportunities in risk management. So I love the idea of high velocity, high volume, micro innovations, little experiments. So obviously that goes a long way. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And, and the nice thing is that it's just way more accessible to us all. And if you really do want the big thing that we all crave, I have often said that, you know, Da Vinci's first painting wasn't the Mona Lisa. Da Vinci first had to learn to paint. 
and he had to paint every day and paint bad paintings and develop his skills. And over time, his Mona Lisa emerged. And the same is true for all of us. Not only do those little things add up to, to, to meaningful wins, but we're developing critical skills. We're essentially building our creativity muscles along the way. Got it. Josh, super enlightening conversation. I wish we had more time to chat, but we unfortunately are out of time. And again, I'm getting the, the cue to wrap. However, thanks so much for joining us. We really appreciate your insights and for joining us on Spotlight. Truly my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. And with that, we will wrap. I'd like to thank you, our viewers and listeners, for joining us today to listen in on these insightful, inspiring, and directive conversations. A few takeaways that I um, am thinking about as we, as we wrap up this session uh continue to brush up on the basics we heard marianne bailey talk about that we've heard kevin mandia talk about that in previous episodes of spotlight um regularly ask yourself if you have the right technologies in place if you're hit by an attack and as marianne indicated that goes well beyond the perimeter that also involves a much broader conversation around cyber resilience which brian spanswick touched on as well backup may not always cut it and then as we just heard josh talking about innovation is key and unlocking that innovation is paramount including as we think about things like security so before we adjourn one more request there is a survey coming your way so you can tell us your thoughts and what topics you would like to hear about on a future spotlight uh, on security in 2023 Please give us your feedback. We look at all the feedback. In the meantime, stay safe and secure. Thank you.